God. Choir, did you like Missionary Baptist Church Choir? It's sung so beautifully, don't you agree? God is so good. Glory to God. Glory to God. We're here to celebrate this home going for our faithful servant of the Lord, Reverend Dr. Frank J. Glass. And what a great man he was, amen? amen. What a great man he was. Yeah. I'm so blessed to be able to come before you today. We're celebrating one of God's finest. Yes. One of God's finest and most humble servants. His record of service spans over five decades. We could only be so blessed and fortunate to serve the Lord for so long. As you have read and heard today, this journey started with Brother Frank, as my, my grandmother used to call him, Brother Frank. It started for him at the tender age of 14, sometime soon after around the age of 17 years of age, Brother Frank began preaching. And one morning while preaching in the mountains, when he gave the altar call, in the distance was a donkey that answered, hee-haw, hee-haw. When he said, who will give his life to Christ? A donkey answered in the distance. <laughs> well, dad would give that speech wherever he went, wherever he preached. And one Sunday, a pastor, said to him, Brother Frank, if you can save a jackass, you can save anybody. <laughs> this great little big man that you see here yeah. today. My dear friend, Dr. Jackson, used to call him the quiet storm. The quiet storm. The Lord has put something very special in my heart to bring before you today. It's one of my favorite sermons that my father would preach, and it comes from the text of Hebrews, chapter 12, verses 1 through 4. And it reads, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and sin which does so easily beset us. And let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. But consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be weary and faint in your minds. Ye have not resisted unto blood, striving against sin. Then there's an accompanying text in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 24 to 27. Know ye not that they which run in a race run all. But one receiveth the prize, so run that ye may obtain. And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they that do, do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. I therefore, I therefore so run, not as uncertainty, so fight I not as one that beateth the air, but I keep under my body and bring it into subjection. Yes. Lest that by any means when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. Let us bow our heads and pray. Lord Jesus Christ, we seek your face. Within the veil, we bow the knee. Oh, let your glory fill this place and bless us. 
Oh Lord. Oh Lord, bless us while we wait on thee. Speak, Lord, in the stillness while we wait on thee. Hush our hearts to listen with expectancy. Speak, O oh blessed Master, in this sacred hour. May we hear your voice. Oh Lord, may we hear your voice and feel your touch of power. We ask it in your dear Son, Jesus' name, and for his sake. Amen. 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 You know, Pastor Glasses was a runner. You know, I might be some of you that know him. Say, Brother Brian, what you talking about? Well, he was a runner, not in the physical sense, but he was a runner in the spiritual sense. He understood his purpose for the race of this life and the importance of it, and whom he was running for. The Apostle Paul, the author of this text this morning, gives us a charge in verse 24 to run the race. By the way, you've already figured out the title of this message is a race to run. A race to run. But Paul is saying here that just run, but to run all. Run all so that ye may obtain it has been my observation that too many of us as Christians are finding it easy to abandon the race of what it means to be a Christian. All right. We say, uh, you know, this Christian thing is just too hard. You know, it's, and it's boring. It's boring. You know, we go to church every day of the week. And it's, it's, it's one day good enough. So we want to abandon the race. Paul reminds us that the race is a marathon. Yes, sir. A race of life with the intended purpose to run. That's right. However, not just run, but run all. Finish the race. Finish the race. Pastor Glasson, as we know, he ran the entire race. Yes, sir. Paul reminds us as to why we run so that we may obtain. You know, in sports, there are rules to govern the race. That's right. That's right. There are rules. Paul prepares us with for this race of life with five important rules. Yeah. The instructions for running the race. First of all, is discipline elimination. All right. Discipline and elimination. Paul eloquently uses metaphors when referring to the Christian life in Hebrews 12. He says, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us. And let us run. What is Paul saying here? He's saying that we need to rid ourselves of some of this extra baggage. We got a lot of baggage that we're carrying around that we don't need. You can't come up to the starting line with all this baggage. You see, some of them, I see you coming and you got these bags, but I'm not talking about physical baggage. I'm not talking about that. The first type of baggage that I'm talking about is that pride. Amen, lights. Amen, lights. We got to get rid of that pride. That's right. You see, pride is a is a part of I, and I that I thing has to die. That's right. So we got to get rid of that pride, and with pride comes that lion tongue, All right. an evil heart, yeah. having a grudge of envy, All help right. us, Lord, jealousy, evil speaking, foul language. We got to get rid of that so that we can run the race. You cannot run a race with these weights. Take them off. That's right. Lay them aside. Cut them out of your life so that we can run. That's right. Secondly, there is determined endurance. Determined endurance. All right. In verse 3, Paul reminds us to run with patience. We have to run with patience. But the word patience in the context of running 
It's an oxymoron. Yes, 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 yes. You say, brother, you want me to run, but then you want me to be patient. This doesn't, this doesn't make sense. This word can be translated to endurance. We find that endurance and persistence has been on the author's mind all the way through chapter 10 down in verse 32. He says, but call to remembrance the former days in which after ye were illuminated. Illuminated, that's a great word. You received the Holy Spirit and entered into a personal relationship with Christ. That's right. A personal relationship. You endured a great fight of afflictions. Oh, you thought you were going to get out of this race without some battle wounds. Running not only requires patience, but you're going to get beat up a little bit. Somebody help me this morning. You're going to get beat up by this race of life. But it's all right. John tells us over in John 4, 4, he says, you are of God, little children, and have overcome them all, because greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. You can accomplish, accomplish anything in Christ. Then down in verse 36, he says, for well, you have need of patience that after ye have done the will of God, you might receive the promise. Right. Somebody look next to each other and say, no patience, no promise. If there's no patience, there's no promise. You got to have patience. Then in verse 37 he says, now the just shall live by faith. But if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. That's right. That's right. Amen. That's a serious race, yeah. saints yeah. of God. Yeah. Right. This, is, this, yeah. is, this is no Olympic marathon. This is a, this is a whole different race yeah. right. with different paths and different hills and valleys. Come on. That's right. oh, yeah. You got to be prepared for this race. Yeah. That's right. Uh -huh. These verses remind me of my dad's determined desire to carry out God's will on earth. I remember back in Tortola when he, well actually when he, he was in St. Martin, we heard the story, he was on the radio station. And he left this job, the mission gave him an opportunity. His, this, this radio job was a great job. He was able to broadcast all over the Caribbean. And everybody was fond of this vo magnificent voice. But then the Lord called, him for a position over in the island of Tortola to serve as pastor of a church that had three members. Three members. Help me somebody. This is a young evangelist that is probably in his early 20s. He's got a family to take care of. He's got a great job on the radio station. And the Lord is calling him to serve as pastor of a church in Tortola, British Virgin Islands, with three members. One had, a, had epilepsy in it. The other one had backslid. You can't even make a deacon out of this, brother. But dad pressed on. He said, I'll go. I'll go. And I remember while he was over there, there were times when he had a church van. And, 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 and we, if you know the island of Tortola, it's very hilly. Yes. There's a lot of hills. And we had an old Volkswagen bus. Right. And going up those hills, the bus would conk out. <laughs> dad and a couple of the members had to get out and push their bus up the hill. Persevering, determined endurance. Right. 
when I think about determined endurance, I think about this old chant that's a former athlete that we used to chant from time to time. He says, I'm going to fight. Fight till I can't fight no more. And when I can't fight no more, I lay down. Bleed a while. Get up. Fight some more. Yeah. Yeah. All for one, one for all. That chant is an, an excerpt from an old Scottish ballad that was employed before every game by former NFL coach Marv Levy of the Buffalo Bills. Yes. However, another ballad that comes to mind when I think of that is, I have decided yes. to follow Jesus. Right. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided yes. to follow Jesus. No turning back. I said, no turning back. No turning back. Though none go with me, I still will follow. Though none go with me, I still will follow. I said, though none go with me, I still will follow. No turning back. No turning back. Run. Run. Run with determined endurance. Looking forward to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Then thirdly, we have the inspiration for the race. The inspiration for the race. Paul spoke about a cloud of witnesses in verse 1 of Hebrews 12. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a witnesses. Who are these witnesses? Right. Who are the cloud of witnesses that Paul is talking about here? Yeah. Well, he talked about them in the previous chapter, and he referred to them as trailblazers. Mm -hmm. Trailblazers that ran the race and endured. Right. That's right. They are Abel, Enoch, huh. Noah, yeah. Abraham, y'all know who they are, yeah. Rahab, Daniel, and a host of others that stood in the alumni section of the Colosseum of Greatness, turning us on to victory, waiting for us to cross the finish line. Yes, I can see them cheering our pastor along, yes. cheering him along as he's coming around, coming around the bend. Yes. Come on, Brother Frank. You can do it, Brother Frank. You can do it, Brother Frank. Come on. Come on, Brother Frank. When he was finishing around with radiation, I could see him in the bandstand, cheering him on victory as he was ringing the bell after every radiation treatment. Come on, Brother Frank, you can do it. You can do it. You can do it. Run so you may obtain. So let's talk about these witnesses for a second in God's divine hall of fame. We got Abel, who ran the race of sacrifice, and he won, for he pleased God, was a better sacrifice than his brother came. Right. Right. Then we have Enoch. Yeah. Enoch walked with God and was not, for God took him. Yeah. Then we have Noah. Uh -huh. Noah ran the race of righteousness, right. and he won. Right. He won, brother. Right. He won. Then we have Abraham. Yes. Abraham ran the race of obedience. That's right. And he won. Yes. Abraham was a willing sacrifice. He was willing to sacrifice his only son. Yes. Uh -huh. His only son from Sarah. That's the right. seed of promise. Yes. For the will of God. Yes. Because we know the story. He's going up the mountain. And his son said, Daddy, Daddy, I see the knife. I see you got the knife. And then, and Daddy, Daddy, I see you got the wood. I see you got the wood. Daddy, you did a good job building the altar. But Daddy, we're missing something, Daddy. Daddy, we're missing something. Daddy, Daddy where's the land? Where's the land? Where's the land? And he said, son, God will provide himself the land. God will provide himself the land. 
Now that is to reflect the pronoun himself, referring to the antecedent, the subject, God. That's the professor in me, always working. Always working. Go ahead. And we see the manifestation of the Lamb in John 1. The Word was made flesh, and John saw him coming down. And he said, there is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Glory be to God in the highest. This brings me to our next point, our fourth point, which is the incentive for running. All right. The incentive for running. In verse 2 of Hebrews 12, we see the incentive for running. Looking forward to Jesus, who for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross. Christ endured the cross despite the shame that was set before him. He endured. We know the story of the crucifixion. They spat upon him as he walked across the street. They gouged him. They, 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 and when they beat him, they beat him with a catamaran tail. It tore flesh from his body. He fled all the way to Calvary. Yes, and when they nailed him to the cross, they stretched him wide. They stretched him wide and placed him up on the cross. They put a crown of thorns on his head. Where our Savior bled for us. Who for the joy, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. He endured the cross. That is the incentive for our life. Fifthly, we have the imitation for the race. The imitation for the race. Almost every person or, or an athlete, I have some of my fellow classmates here today who are all athletes. And I know you all would identify with this. Almost all of us have someone that we idolize and emulate. In ministry for my dad, he was a big fan of an old English theologian by the name of Stephen Alford. Some of you may not know about who that is. But this was an old English theologian that my dad was so fixated on when he first came into ministry. I would, I would call him telling the stories when he would he had a room on the front porch of his mother's house and he, he, he carved out a sign and he put it on his door. Evangelist at work, do not disturb. This is a 17-year-old boy talking about it. Do not disturb in his mama's house. Evangelist at work. This is a man whose eyes were fixed. Then there were others, like John R. Rice, yeah, that's right. Jack Worth, Charles Spurgeon, right, Billy Graham, yeah. and D.L. Moody. Right, and as we know, he was a great cricket player. So in sports, my dad was also a big fan of the game of cricket. And his number one guy was uh, Frank Warren. How many cricketers we have in the audience? <laughs> Not very many. That's all right, Daddy. You by yourself. <laughs> Frank Worrell was a great batsman. And Dad, you probably see in your program, he's got that pose and everything. He would idolize him. And how see him come, he would get that back. And he would stand in a certain way. He idolized him. Then he also, on the defensive side, his guy, was the name of uh, Jackie Hendricks. Jackie Hendricks was a wicked keeper. There have been many athletes that have come before us that ran the race but were disqualified or disproved and considered a castaway. Some of these names you may be familiar with. They are Marion Jones, who ran in the 2000 Olympics and won a several gold medals. But was later disqualified for using performance enhancement drugs. And there's also Pete Rose, 
who was one of the most celebrated baseball players in the Major League Baseball during the 70s and the 80s, right. but was later banned from baseball forever and was denied entrance into the Baseball Hall of Fame because he betted on baseball. Yeah, that's right. And there's Tiger Woods, America's favorite once upon a time, was in the height of his career and recognized as the most focused, disciplined, and extraordinary pro golfer of all time. Then he cheated on his wife, and the world disapproved him and called him an outcast. Cost him millions of dollars, and for a time, his career. All of these athletes will be considered a poor witness or representative of the race. The eternal question is, who do we idolize? Who do we idolize? Who do we imitate? We can't imitate anyone from the alumni section of the Coliseum of Greatness. We can't do that. If you imitate Moses, you would have to commit murder. If you imitate David, you would have to commit adultery and murder. If you imitate Abraham, you would have to resort to lies. There's only one we can imitate. Looking on to Jesus. Looking on to Jesus. Mark the perfect one. Mark the perfect one. He stood before Pilate and Pilate asked, should I crucify your king? I have examined him, and I find no fault in this man. Come on. Now. Should I? What would you want me to do with him? He was blameless. That's right. Blameless. However, all of us have faults. That's right. All of us have faults. That's right. Abraham had faults. David, a man after God's own heart. He had faults. Only looking unto Jesus, church. Yeah. Only looking unto Jesus. He is the right focus. The right focus for running. He is the right faith. The right faith for running. That's right. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 7 through 8, Paul wrote, I have fought a good fight. Yeah. I have finished my course. I have finished my course. I was sitting in that morning. I had went to relieve my mom so she can go home and take care of some things on the day that dad passed away. And I sat and I talked with him. He was tired. And I just gave him some time to himself, and I just was reflecting. I reflected on the love that he had for his wife. All right. Amen. 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 And how precious she was. She never left his side. Amen. Amen. She stood by him day and night, day and night, taking care of him. Mom, I salute you. Dad knew who he wanted. I talked about the incentive for running. But Dad knew he wanted Mom to be his wedded wife. Yeah. He was the most eloquent man that you ever wanted to meet. <laughs> One of the most eloquent men that you ever wanted to meet. His proposal went a little something like this. <laughs> He says, as I gaze into your beauteous, bounteous, beaming eyes, I am literally lonesomely lost in a daring, dazzling, delightful dream in which your fair, felicitous, fancy-filled face is ever-present, like a colossal, comprehensive constellation. Will you be my soul-filled, satisfied spouse? <laughs> Mom looked into his eyes and said, if that's a proposal, say it in English. <laughs> Race to run. She ran that 
grace along with them. Every day. Every day. For 54 years, this December, December 6th, would, would have been their 55th year anniversary. But we give God all the praise and glory for the 54 years that they brought them. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness. Those that live a life outside of Christ run the race of life to obtain a corruptible crown. That's right. That's right. Church, you got to realize and you got to understand what race you run. You better know, you better be sure, you better be very sure that you are in the right race. I don't want a crown that's going to rot and fall apart on my head. I want a crown of glory. An incorruptible crown. An incorruptible one. One that never fades or grows old. But the biggest joy of them all is when we get to heaven and gather with all the saints, all the saints in the saints hall of fame, and we crown Jesus, King of Kings, Lord of Lords. Oh, what a day! I said, oh, what a day! What a day of rejoicing that would be when we all see Jesus. I say, when we all see Jesus. We'll sing and shout for victory. For victory! Yeah. Victory! Yeah. Victory! Yeah. Victory in Jesus! Victory in Jesus! Don't give up the race! Don't give up the race! Don't give up the race! May God continue to bless you and shine his light upon you. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. 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 I would be I would like to thank Dr. Preston for his wonderful hospitality and opening up his doors. For the members of Peace for Time, we just thank you for your gracious hospitality and welcome us in. Dr. Preston has been a long time friend of my father and I just thank God for you, sir. And I pray that God will continue to bless you and your ministry and that we would also become friends. Amen. To God be the glory. Amen.